the suicide rates as linked to particular instances, particular areas in the city. But I'm, well, like Dukas also, she used official statistics as her source of data. But unlike Dukas, she acknowledged that yes, there are certain factors that um, contribute to higher suicide rates, um, and one of the factors she identified was, for instance, the dissolution of familial ties. Yes, she said there are these kind of broader social factors, but also the meaning of suicide, suicide is <coughs> intensely personal. So not everyone who experiences a particular distressing situation will kill themselves. So they have, to, she says, so there have to be particular personal reasons. Now, more recently, sort of in the 20th century, I guess, um, Jack Douglas um, took a kind of looked at suicide again, but what he was interested in was the um, the, the, the way in which um, the, um, the, the he was very critical of official statistics. So he was concerned with um, the individual motivations of social, so subjective meanings of social actors. So he was actually very critical of this idea that there can be an overarching explanation for why people kill themselves. Um, and finally, or kind of, not finally, um, I think it's sort of one of the key studies. Um, we have um, Atkinson who looked at um, sort of common sense interpretations of coroner's views in order to reach a verdict of suicide. So he looked at the kind of the sh shared meaning of professional services uh, of suicide as well. Of course the other people have worked on suicide as well. Um, so that's sort of just a quick run through some of the kind of key studies in the area. Now you'll notice it sort of finishes off in, well, it sort of ends in the late um, 70s. And the question is then, what happened since? And um, what, what I can see was that the study of suicide very much moved from, from sociology, I think, even more so moved to psychology and psychiatry. And nowadays, the, especially in the field of suicidology, is uh, dominated by these um, two disciplines. What that means is also that with the change from um, the, which discipline takes the lead, um, what has come kind of focus, I think, on a particular approach, and that's mostly quantitative. Um, suicide is very much considered a pathology. Now, I'm not saying that it's a, it's a good thing to, to kill yourself, but what we're going to argue for is to say that actually mental health, for instance, doesn't in itself, um, it isn't in itself a sufficient factor to explain suicide. And especially, I think, if you look if you look at some of the studies in the field, and um, from a kind of sociological or anthropological perspective, you're struck by how simplistic the categories are. For instance, um, suicide notes are being um, explored in the context of national identities, Hungarian suicide notes. Now, there's several millions of Hungarians, um, some of which suicide, but they will have will come from very different um, backgrounds. They will have had very different experiences. So there is um, a real question about how general life or existence is. So, with that in mind, with this kind of current state of the field in mind, we then 
thought, well, you know, can there be something like a kind of sociological or anthropological sort of useless? Especially like if you think that certainly for all anthropologists, um, a lot of anthropological work involves talking to people, living living with people, share, sharing life with people. Now that poses a kind of fundamental question in, in suicide because the person who you most would like to talk to is not there cannot be asked. So can there be a kind of sociological or anthropological study of suicide? Also, is it possible to um, do a study of suicide that's qualitatively different? So that um, looks at differences rather than at, at the generalized, uh, general, sort of generalized ability. Can there be a study of individual suicides? But also, is it so, so can we actually pay attention to the individual, the sort of personal dimensions of suicide? But also then again, can we do so while still having an impact on policy and prevention? Because that's one of one of the sort of side effects if you say, well, actually it's all about individual factors, then what is what can be said about uh, a prevention strategy, for instance, that should be applying to a wider range of people. So, and that's where um, I think, you know, should uh, give a credit to, to Jonathan, you know, who, who took the lead here and um, developed this idea of sociological auditing study. And he took some inspiration from the tradition of psychological auditing which look at a range of um, sources, coroner's, coroner's records, um, sort of statements and uh, reports by uh, medical professionals, interviews tend to be involved. But these kind of psychological auto systems, again, approach suicide from various <coughs> psychological pathological kind of um, approach. The other study that kind of provides some inspiration here was the social autopsy by Eric Feinberg, who was published in Harvard Heatwave. And anyway. um, I think it's, it's a really it's a really fantastic study. But again he sort of looks more at the sort of the wider um, macro level ecological perspective of a particular disaster in so, what did we do? Um, we studied 100 inquest trials that ended in a verdict of suicide. And I'll get to the point about the verdict and what, what it means to, um, for a case to have resulted in a verdict of suicide. We also had some supplementary data, but actually for this particular study, we didn't really draw on that. We did observe inquests, we did um, do a couple of interviews with relatively strength and professionals, and um, there was also did a um, survey of the uh, account. Actually, they, they played, uh, they didn't really play a role in the study. So, in England and Wales, certain kinds of deaths have to be investigated by a coroner. Coroners are independent judicial officers. They're associated with the legal system, but they're independent from it. They're usually part of, say, the council. Um, and the office itself is actually one of the oldest um, in England and Wales. It was first established in the 12th century um, when the coroner was there as a representative of the Crown, if this was in contrast to the local sheriff. Um, now, the coroner, so certain deaths have to be reported to the coroner, and whether this, they have to be reported or not depends on the manner of death, so has there been sudden, unnatural, or are the causes of death unclear? So basically, or sudden, unnatural, or cause of death are clear, or ha has the has the death happened in circumstances?
this is where the autonomy of the deceased person was compromised. So for instance, deaths in prison or deaths by people who have been um, detained under the Mental Health Act um, have to be investigated as well. Also, deaths on the railways have to be investigated. There's a certain number of deaths that have to be reported. Now, the coroner then decides whether there will be an inquest. And an inquest is like an inquiry to find out um, about the identity of the deceased person and how, when, and where they came to the death. They, um, they're non adversarial, so that means that in an inquest, the question is not about who is to blame for the death, it is very much about the facts matter, nothing but the facts. Um, but also inquests end with a public hearing, so, I mean, everyone can go, you could go if you wanted to, um, and it ends with a public hearing where witnesses will be called again, um, where um, certain, certain persons can ask questions, and uh, where the coroner will finally and it will end with a conclusion, which is a whole document that um, lists the causes of death and um, includes the verdict in terms of what kind of category of death is it. And um, in England and Wales, the most common ones, the most common verdicts have been accidents in 2008 in accident and misadventure, natural causes of suicide. And that's sort of a, an order that has stayed fairly stable in the world. Coroners can also make up their own um, verdicts as well. So um, they have, they are a kind of um, an office with a lot of um, discretion, they have a lot of power to decide. Now, <coughs> we best that sort of our work happened at the, um, the coroner's office in the medium-sized UK city. And the, um, the files we looked at were stored in a box room at the back of the courtroom. I have to say, I was actually quite pleased about it, but when, when, I, was, when, first, uh, when I was first called, oh, you said, do you want to work on this project? I thought, yeah, I've got files. There's probably going to be like a dank, damp, sort of basement room. But it was actually quite a, quite a nice space for us to work in. Um, so we worked at the coroner's office and the coroner's jurisdiction itself um, included the city but also sort of the hinterland. So it was quite a sort of mix between rural and urban. Jonathan arranged um, access, again kind of at the discretion of the coroner. I think we were quite lucky in that regard because um, coroners could be very protective of um, their files. Um, we identified the files that had ended in the, the verdict of suicide with the help of the coroner's staff, so we didn't just like, leave through the files, but we knew which ones we needed to get. And we were allowed to transcribe um, from the files. So we could actually bring our laptops in, but we weren't allowed to to make copies. Um, we recorded certain key factors on a on a form, such as age, gender, cause of death, uh, what the verdict was, um, and then copied out significant passages from witnesses, and expert statements, and we copied all the suicide notes. Um, we actually had a category for ethnicity as well, but that mm, actually never, hardly ever got used because it actually wasn't recorded, or obviously recorded in the files. So, so the inquest files themselves were quite mundane documents. They were simple kind of document wallets you can buy with the environment. And I think that kind of combination of sort of everyday bureaucratic appearance of the file 
and what it could contain could you know, be quite um, quite shocking at times. Now, what went into the files was like, like the form forms filled out by the coroners or first and also by the police officers who would usually be the first on the, on the scene and who would report that there this might be a death that had to be investigated. There would also be scribbles on the file wallets saying, you know, what kind of documents do we still need? Where does this, you know, what kind of reports do we still need? Um, or some, sometimes there were also notes about what should happen or what should not happen. Um, there were police statements from witnesses and significant others. I think the police statement is not quite right. Um, I think there's, there are more statements of witnesses <coughs> and significant others. Now, the, coroner's, the coroner has officers who help him or her to interview witnesses. And those people often have a background as police officers. And so the statements they take from the witnesses very much read like um, this statement in so far as they're only focused on what the witness actively observed. So, not quite right, sorry about that. Um, there were forensic pathology reports, so usually if an inquest is opened, you, um, there will be an autopsy, usually with, uh, if there's a suspicion that um, alcohol or drugs were involved, were involved uh, so say maybe someone died from an overdose, then it would also be a toxicology report. And then medical left left of reports, such as like natural ones, suicide notes would be included. Sometimes there were mobile phone records. There would be, for instance, um, photographs sometimes. Sometimes there would be emergency service logs as well. And then, because the kind of files were built up, there would be letters to the coroner, for instance, afterwards for um, relatives asking for um, further information or access to the files or sometimes press. So anything related to a particular case would be in this file. Now, suicide is no, no longer a crime since the Suicide Act of 1961. But it remains highly sensitive and controversial very distressing as well to the relatives um, of the to the degree. Um, and it poses certain challenges in terms of preserving both anonymity and context, especially if you want to look at, as we did, individual cases. So how can you actually make sure that you're not, um, that, that you preserve anonymity and yet kind of um, so um, don't lose the detail, and I think we were pretty careful in that regard. Um, an unexpected side effect of the whole study was um, they raised our awareness about the effects of documentary research on the emotional well-being of the researcher. Now, in sociology and in anthropology, I think there's been much more attention being paid in recent years um, to, the, um, to the effects the kind of the, that, that research can have on, on, on the researchers. But what surprised us was that it's not just about face-to-face -face interactions that can be distressing, but it's actually also what you read the documents that can be distressing. And I remember both um, Ben and I sort of at some point talked uh, together, both our partners at the time had said, but we don't really need to know what you're doing at work, you know, just keep work at work, you know. And at that point, we decided that actually we needed to have a certain debriefing mechanism. So if anyone, any one of us had been to the coroner's office and would come back to the office, the other one would just make space and say, just do you want to talk about this, you know, what did you do? Um, and uh, just, you know, let the other person reflect or just, just talk sort of very un, um, un sort of free-flowing way. Because reading those documents did create a 
emotions can be created, reactions can be created, thought values, sad case, or this was, this seemed really difficult person to be with. Or so there were there was a kind of an effect on us as researchers there. Now the analytic implications were also quite interesting because we we have this sense that kind of the the files contain quite a range of data. And what we wanted to do was to, to avoid reduction and to say we wanted to avoid um, kind of to, to brush differences and difficulties under the carpet. So we wanted to be clear about what we could know. Um, we took kind of quite a pragmatic position in terms of um, how to approach the data as well. And wanted to use the sort of the idea of common sense theorizing, not as a, a kind of people's own ideas about why someone committed suicide. Um, wanted to use this as a as a resource rather than as a way to dismiss the quality of our data. We explored the data from a range of disciplinary, theoretical, and epistemological, methodological positions. And but the overall kind of approach was to look at it as a kind of to approach as a qualitatively driven mixed method analysis. So we have um, some quantitative analysis involved, but it was very much done from a qualitative point of view. So building up from the data, looking at the differences, and then kind of, you know, rather than starting from what, basically from the ground up, rather than thinking and testing hypotheses. Now, one of the things we looked at was this idea of what kind of identities are created in the files. And in the files, the inquests, sort of, or in the inquests, the, um, what happens, the inquest emerges as a space to create and to extend um, identities. Also, and I've said inquests are non-adversarial, so questions about blame and culpability are actually not addressed. But if you look at the kind of the, the witness reports, for instance, think of those ideas about why have this happened, who's to blame, were very much at the witness's, um, on the witness's mind. Um, and the concern um, I think it was a sort of distance of the way of, it, there were certain factors that allowed the witness to extract themselves from that question of culpability. Somewhere professional, for instance, if you how, how you had known a deceased person, and somewhere temporal in terms of when did you know them? Did you actually know them while you were while, while they were alive, or did you actually first encounter them while they were dead? Um, <coughs> so just to kind of compare the two. One of the um, groups of people we looked at were the medical professionals and their reports took quite a different, depending on what kind of profession they were, they, they took quite a different form. I mean, the GPs, for instance, could be quite free-flowing, whereas um, the, um, well, the GPs, the psychiatrists and the psychologists could be quite free-flowing. But if it was a psychology report, for instance, it had a very kind of clear um, format. So I think the hierarchy between professionals was established in that way. But for the GP psychiatrists and psychologists, they focused very much on the technical aspects of care. So what kind of, um, basically, what kind of medications have been prescribed? And then so sometimes you can find like a long list of um, um, drugs and not and then maybe like a small, like a short sentence about it. And then there were other factors such as like, you know, his relationship had broken down and he didn't get to see his children. And the medical professionals were very much concerned with creating their own identities or research establishing the identities of medical professionals as a deceased person's patient. 
So you have to kind of look, look at this in the context of these reports are being written at the request of the coroner. So they're not just like the file being pulled out, but they are written for the purpose. Now, as far as the labor were concerned, there was a range, were a range of connections to the secret. Some of them wouldn't know them at all. They might buy them. Others were intimately acquainted. But what was kind of interesting there was that um, they had no recourse to the professional systems that the, the medical professionals have here. And so their own identities were very much more intertwined with that of the disease. Um, but again, similarly uh, to the professionals, what they were trying to do was to kind of situate the causes of the death outside their control. So there was common theme about, oh, I didn't know, I couldn't tell, we seemed fine. So, again, it's about that this question about who is, well, not who is to blame, but you know, who, what, what kind of contributed to the death. So, so and, and the question about blame is, is interesting in the context of the official idea about what we also looked at suicide notes, and suicide notes are, um, study of suicide notes has uh, been considered to be inconclusive by Edwin Schneidman, who's sort of the, the founding father of suicidology. Um, it's the suicide notes were the only document in the file that had been written while the syphilis was still alive. So they had, had not been written in the inquest. Um, it's not sufficient to have a certain find a suicide note for a murder of suicide. Um, in fact, suicide needs um, a higher standard of proof than the other um, other murders. Um, we actually had quite a quite a sort of high number of uh, suicide notes. Usually, it's twenty percent that you get, but in this case, it's nearly um, eighty-nine, and we had about. How I had it, there was a range of styles, dresses, appearances, and dresses, and receipts. So there was some of the notes clearly been written in a state of distress. Some were much more um, considered. Sometimes we found different versions. Some of them had been written on the first item of paper that had come to hand. So again, you can't really sort of generalise on. What was, um, what was available to the, to the witness there? Uh, to not to the witness, what was available to write uh, so sorry. Now, the sort of key ideas from looking at those two sort of is that, that, I mean, they're not representations of a deceased mind. They're not necessarily, they're not simply a way in which you can say, clearly, this is someone who um, is a very ill person. And in fact, all we would say is they have, even if the note shows signs that the person was clearly distressed, they were intended as ways of communicating. So they were intended as a way to get a message across. Um, so as I said, they were written to, to be understood. There were practical aspects that they would try to organize, funerals, how possession should be divided. An emotional aspect, for instance, how the, um, the bereaved should feel about the death. Now, one of the common features is um, was that there was often a, an idea of an, an apology involved. And we would argue that the apology in this case almost acts as a sort of um, anthropological gift. It's a way of establishing a relationship whether the person wants it or not. So it has a certain importance, it has a certain coercive character. And because it establishes a, a relationship, it then becomes can become a conduit through which the um, practical aspects and the emotional aspects of the suicide note can be executed. So it kind of establishes, re-establishes a, a connection that has been um, severed through the death. There's also a kind of 
methodological coda to the study of suicide notes. And that's that um, the notes have often been looked at um, in, a, in an isolated way, just simply as the notes. But what happened if we looked at them in, in the context of the whole file was that suddenly certain absences of the notes, certain gaps became apparent. So for instance, if a note was very, um, very grateful, very, very kind, mentioned neighbours or friends down the road, but from the files we actually knew that maybe the daughter or the son had been excluded. So there is, I think, if one looks at suicide notes, I think one needs to be careful about the wider context and the social relationships that the person has with them their death. Um, right, so we, we also um, move in more to the kind of um, <coughs> pragmatic, um, sort of less particularist um, approach that we took to suicide notes. We um, adapted ideas from the um, theories of record of action, um, theory that the study that comes from the new social movement, and um, to, to the study of suicide. And we use that in order to um, bring out kind of different the dynamic sort of relationships that are in play um, if someone takes their lives. Um, so that is not, it's not enough to say, well, there's unifactorial kind of accounts of um, uh, suicide or that there's sort of risk factors. What we are arguing for is this idea of certain dynamic clusters of, uh, of circumstances. So it's a kind of shifting relationships that the, the previous experience of um, the individual has to be taken into account. What they, you know, what, what they had experienced, what they knew, what they thought, as the values and beliefs as well. Um, you know, what affected a, an individual's assessment of the situation. And how do these factors then contribute to what's called the repertoire of action? So the ways of responding to a particular situation that the suicidal individual may have at their um, disposal. So what kind, how, how did they assess the strategies that worked and didn't work, um, say, when faced with um, relationships? breakdown, um, how did they, what did they consider to be reasonable behaviour? Was it to, um, was it, was suicide something that was maybe not, was not as um, far out for them, something that maybe was actually, you know, had been, had happened to um, people they knew. So again, so it's about the dynamic combination of multiple factors that take into the kind of historic experience of the values and beliefs, uh, beliefs of the individuals to create the possibilities in which they can react, which may then include um, the option to take their lives. Um, now, I think that I mentioned this in the abstract. One of the, one of the, um, current policy in terms of suicide prevention very much focuses on um, young men. And it's also, the, I think, the, the common um, common sense approach, that it's young men that are most at risk. Um, however, we looked at the data that we had, and there's actually, despite sort of the highest sort of bars happening age. And so um, we used a kind of um, theory adapted from uh, Lal Samson's about uh, informal control and convenience to try to think, well, why do people at certain stages, certain, part, uh, certain moments,
own of their life forces. Um, think about for themselves. Um, Lauten Thompson actually sort of a criminologist, um, but we found it actually works quite well on the first slide as well. Um, so, and that kind of applying that theory then sort of emphasised the importance of social ties, um, and especially in middle age, so mid thirties, forties, um, the what can happen there if all the kind of the social ties that you've built up and invested in um, fall through, come to an end, that can lead to a very bad crisis. So we looked at sort of suicide across the life course, and you do have young people in crisis, and they often have much more, like very sort of negative sort of childhood experiences, um, and there is present form of suicide The midlife gender patterns, I was, that's what I was saying, is kind of work and employment um, relationships with um, spouses, children can be um, protected. But again, the, the, the flip side of this is if those relationships, if those employment children uh, work sort of fall away, Amongst the old people, it was the idea that the social ties had been loosened through the experience of bereavement. It's this idea of, like, all well, my friends are gone, what am I still doing here? And it was kind of um, exacerbated by the presence of physical health problems. So the idea that people were afraid of especially losing their mind, ideas about Alzheimer's. Thank you. 